Thank you for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel for our weekly Bible study. I wish above all things that you are prospering and in good health and even as your soul prospers. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we began this study uh, by praying to you, asking you to calm our minds so that our thoughts are not rested upon what's going on in this world and in our lives but on what you're saying to us uh, that will strengthen us in the lives that we live, that we might uh, exemplify the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our focus tonight is found in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. The English Standard Version reads, For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble, of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish uh, in the world to shame the wise. And God chooses uh, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chooses what uh, is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of our life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, instead of the divisiveness brought about by crediting uh, Peter and Paul and Apollos uh, for things that only God deserves the credit for, it brought about division in the Corinthians church. We discovered that personalities within the body of Christ, even in this day and age, are causing divisiveness instead of unity. It should be understood that this type of divisiveness is useful, usually kept quiet and out of the public view. Much like many families, usually within a family there's divisiveness, there's all kinds of confusion, people are not speaking to each other, uh, there are some families where uh, daughters or son don't speak to their fam with their parents for years and years. And uh, there are parents that don't speak to their children for years and years. But usually this is kept out of the public view. And uh, that's the way it is in the church. It's important for us to remember that as the body of Christ, that we are called to glorify God and not personalities or individuals in the church. The Corinthians had a tendency to be puffed up with pride. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 uh, says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to... Uh, go beyond what is written, that none, here it is, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Uh, Paul is saying that uh, he, he and Apollos were uh, trying to live what they were teaching so that as they, the people would not see them being puffed up, that they wouldn't become puffed up. And, and as, a, as, a, as a personal statement, I've noticed that uh, uh, too often the, the strong figures, the personalities, the pastor, whatnot, uh, the de chairman of the deacon board and so forth, uh, uh, the, as they exemplify their strength, then they are people that are following them that will start to take on their characteristics and uh, exhibit uh, strengths like that. And, 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 and in all that doing, we fail to glorify God. Uh, now, the message version of that same verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, Paul says, All I'm doing now, or right now, friends, is showing you how these things pertaining to Apollos and myself 
so that you also will learn uh, restraint and not rush into making judgment without knowing all the facts. It's important to look at things that God from God's view. And I would rather not see you inflating or deflating reputations based upon mere hearsay. And then 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 uh, says, I know there are some among you who are so full of themselves, they never listen to anyone, let alone me. They don't think uh, I'll ever show up in person, but I'll be there sooner than you think. And God willing, uh, then we'll see if they're full of anything but hot air. And verse 20 says, God's way is not a matter of mere talk. It's an empowered life. And that's what we believers should be striving for, to live empowered lives. Paul uh, lets the Corinthians know that uh, he says, I'm, and, 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 and I'm paraphrasing this. He says, I must not simply look the other way, that we should not look the other way when things are going on in the church that is bringing about divisiveness. We should not look the other way and hope that it goes away on its own. Bring it out in the open and deal with them in the authority of Jesus, our master. But the gospel of God's grace leaves no room for personal boasting. Uh, God is not impressed with our looks or our social position or our achievements, our natural heritage, or our financial status. Paul reminds them of what they were in verse 26. They were not wise, or mighty, or honorable. God called them not because of what they were, but in spite of what they were. And God didn't call us based upon what we were, but in spite of what we were. And the fact is clear that while we were yet sinners, God called us and he sent his son to die for us while we were yet God's enemies. It is the same with members of any congregation these days. The Corinthian church was composed primarily of ordinary people who were terrible sinners. Before Paul's conversion, he had been very self-righteous and had to give up his religion to become a child of God. And there are some things that we need to give up in order to, to have a closer walk with the Lord, to, to be more like him, to live lives that are empowered. The Corinthians were at the other end of the spectrum, and yet they were not too sinful for God to reach and to save them. Paul reminded the Corinthians of why God had called them. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 27 through 31. And this is the message version. It says, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that uh, the culture overlooked and exploited and abused? Chose those nobodies to expose the, the, the hallow pretension of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right, the, the, the right thinking, right living, clean slates, fresh starts, all of that come from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow your horn, blow a trumpet for God instead. The message and the miracle of God's grace, Jesus utterly confounded, he put to shame the high and the mighty people of this world. The wise of this world cannot understand how God 
changes sinners into saints. And the mighty of this world are helpless to duplicate the miracles. John chapter 15 verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. We can't understand that the wise in this world can't understand it. God's foolishness confounds the wise and weaknesses confounds the mighty. The record of the church history are filled with accounts of great sinners whose lives were transformed by the power of God's word. In my own ministry, as uh, in the ministry of most pastors and preachers, I have seen amazing things take place that the lawyers and psychologists could not understand. You have seen uh, delinquent teenagers uh, become successful students and useful citizens. We've seen marriages restored and homes reclaimed much to the amazement of the courts. God works the way he does so that no flesh should glory in his presence. Salvation must be completely of grace, otherwise God cannot get the glory. You know the verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, that says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. This is the truth that Paul wanted to get across to the Corinthians because they were guilty of glorifying men as well as themselves as stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, therefore let no man glory in men. And if we glory in men, even godly men like Peter and Paul and Apollos, we are robbing God of the glory that he alone deserves. It was this sinful attitude of pride that was helping to cause division in the Corinthian church. And finally, Paul reminds the Corinthians of all that they had in Jesus Christ in verse 30 through 31 of the first chapter uh, of first Corinthians verse 30 says he is the source of your life in Christ Jesus whom God made our wisdom our righteousness our sanctification and redemption all of that we have in Jesus Christ and verse 31 says therefore as it is written let no one boast or let no one who boast boast in the Lord instead. And since every believer is in Christ and has all that he needs, why compete with each other or compare ourselves to each other? It is the Lord who has done it all. He's He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And, and we can find that uh, same verse, that's, that's 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 31. It's also quoted in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. And it's quoted again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Let him that glory, glory in the Lord. Now, let's shut the coin. That's an old term from the old days when when my grandmother and brother and I lived on the plantation, shucking the coin, that's taking that, that shuck off and, and then you're exposed to exposing the coin that is underneath the shuck. So let's shuck the coin and see what we really have here. What do we really have in Christ Jesus? The spiritual blessings that we need are not abstractions that are always just out of our reach. God is not dangling in front of us and keeping them from our reach. They are all in a person, and that person is only Jesus Christ. First of all, I mentioned he's our wisdom. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says, their hearts, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. 
and unto all riches of full assurance and understanding that uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then he's our righteousness. First Corinthians, uh, rather, Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse twenty-one says, "For he had made him uh, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became what we were, sinners, so that laden with sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. And then the next gift, the next blessing is." He's our sanctification. John chapter 17, verse 19 says, and for their sake, I sanctified myself. This is Jesus talking for their sake, for our sake. I sanctified myself that they, that we also might be sanctified through the truth. And then he's our redemption. Romans 3 and 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, actually, the emphasis here is that God shows his wisdom by means of the righteousness and sanctification and redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. Each of these theological words carry a special meaning for Christians. Righteousness has to do with our right standing before God. Jesus carried our sins away from us as our scapegoat. And now we are justified. God has declared us righteous in Christ Jesus. But we are also sanctified. We're set apart to belong to God and to serve him. Redemption emphasizes the fact that we are set free because Jesus paid the price for us on the cross. And this will lead to complete redemption when Christ returns. So in one sense, we have the uh, three tenses of salvation given right here in the lesson. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, which is justification or set right with God. And we are being saved from the power of sin, which is sanctification. We are being set apart for God's use. And we shall be, be saved from the presence of sin, which is glorification, because sin can't dwell with God. And when we are with God, then we'll be glorified with Christ Jesus. And every believer has all of these blessings in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Therefore, why glory in men? Why glory in personalities? What does Paul have that you do not have? Does Peter have more of Christ than any of you? It was likely that Jesus Christ had more of Peter than Peter had of him. But then that's another lesson. We should glory in the Lord and not in ourselves or our spiritual leaders. Now, I recommend that you review this entire chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, so you can see the mistakes that the Corinthians were making, mistakes that helped to create, create problems in the church. They were not living up to their holy calling, but were instead following the standards of the world. And far too often, it appears that there's more of the world in the church than it is us in the world uh, uh, working to change the world. More of the world is changing the church, and it ought not be so. The church at Corinth ignored, no, ignored the fact that they were called into a wonderful spiritual fellowship with the Lord and with each other. But instead, they identified with human leaders. I'm of Apollos, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas or, or Peter. And we do that today. And creating division within the church. Instead of glorifying God 
and his grace. They were pleasing themselves and boasting about men. They were a defiled church, a divided church, and a disgraced church. But before we pass judgment on them, we should examine our own church and our own lives. We have been called to be holy unto God. We, are, we have been called into fellowship with God and with each other. And we have been called to glorify God. The question is, are we living up to our calling? One of the reasons for the ordinance of baptism and communion is so important that they remind us of the significance of the two uh, which are uh, to remind us often of the importance of Jesus Christ in our lives. On one Friday, Jesus died on an old rugged cross and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. He only used that borrowed tomb for three days because on the third day, he rose from the dead with all power in his hand. Of not, no one else is that true. Only Jesus, only Jesus, not Adam and Eve or Eve, not Abraham, Isaac or Jacob, not Moses, Joshua, not King David or King Solomon. None of what we call the minor or the major prophets, none of the gospel writers, not even Paul or Silas or Timothy or Paulus or Peter. Not any of the 12 disciples even. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Remember, we are called to glorify God and not any individuals and not ourselves. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that have taught, inspired, empowered, and enlightened us tonight. Now we pray that you will give the increase that we will truly hear and understand for the purpose of applying what we've heard. We thank you for your written word. And we thank you for allowing us to, to be students of your word so that we can learn to live according to your word on a daily basis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's all I have for tonight. I pray that you will be blessed from these words of this Bible study. I pray that you are uh, wearing a mask in public and that you are practicing safe distances, at least six feet. Uh, 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 something that I've noticed at Walmart that it seems like a lot of people don't, don't notice uh, is that they've got... Uh, a green arrow pointing up that rows that you should go up. But uh, so often we see people coming towards us on those roads. So, so go the direction that they set. They set those, that, that, those directions to help keep us separate. So practice wearing a mask in public. Practice safe distancing. And wash your hands often, at least 20 minutes each time you wash it. You never can wash it too much. Again, Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you the next time. May God bless you real good. Goodbye.